good morning. I didn't even have to use the zero noise sign and everybody just quieted down. I guess words out that we have a pretty dynamic speaker with us this morning. Uh, but before I introduce our speaker, um, there is something that we have to do. Today's his birthday. Yeah. And so we really have to sing to our speaker this morning, right? All right, here we go. And if I can sing, anybody can sing. So I'll start and you join in real quickly because we want his birthday to be a nice birthday. All right. Happy birthday to you. go into that how old are you now <laughs> it's not appropriate um, this morning we have the opportunity to hear solemn thomas l talk with us about inspiring young people to achieve their potential um, working with children who really oftentimes feel powerless who have a uh, few opportunities and who yet have tremendous amounts of potential um, he's going to speak with us this morning about some of the successes that um, they've experienced, some of the ways in which you as future teachers can motivate them, um, some of the ways you as future school administrators can support faculty and students and motivate them to be all that they can be. So please um, join me in welcoming our speaker this morning, Solomon Thomas Allen. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Now the perfect gift would be for everyone in this audience to tell me that you were up at 7 a.m. watching me play chess on BOC. <laughs> That's the real birthday gift. Since because since I'm staying in Rehoboth with my family, that means if I had to be there at 6:50 a.m., that means I had to leave Rehoboth at about 5:50 a.m. And since as men and we have to put on a shirt and tie. It takes us a little longer than normal five minutes to throw on a hoodie. So I had to be up about maybe five o'clock. So uh, it, um, it was, a, or earlier, it was a tough run, but it was encouraging to know that when I was done, that I was going to be uh, be here. And I did let the folks know on the BOC that they said, oh, are you going back? I said, no, actually, I'm have a, a morning session um, over at the college. I'll be spending it with some students. Uh, who are interested in education and social work and, and administration and policy and those types of things. So I am, and then for me to be here on my birthday, I mean, you know, you must know you are special. Because <laughs> I can think of quite a few other places that I would like to be, and you too, on your birthday. But, um, but I know that if I'm going to uh, truly make some difference in this world, and my mother would often ask, you know, say to me, you know, when you leave, this earth, leave it knowing that you somehow made it a better place, you know, for someone else. And, and I know if, if that is to happen, then, um, then I, I must uh, take some time to share with you how um, people have changed and influenced my life. People who, who uh, have sat in an audience somewhere thinking about becoming a teacher. And, and, um, and the NEA talks about quite often how uh, the majority of uh, students who enter into teacher education programs want to teach somewhere close to where they grew up. And most of the times it's a, uh, a suburban, affluent, middle class, nice neighborhood. And um, the majority of the jobs are just not available in many of those places. I know in suburban Philadelphia, um, some of those districts receive 100 applications for every position. Um, and I know why some of those districts are paying upwards of eighty, ninety thousand dollars $90,000 a year. Uh, so it's very competitive, but 80% uh, of the jobs that you, you are going to get uh, or that are going to be available to you are going to be working in either a urban setting or a rural setting. Um, and those students are going to bring to you um, some specific challenges. Uh, and not that students from affluent areas don't have issues also, um, many of you know, some of you are affluent, some of you have friends who are. I have some friends who, I don't call me often, but some <laughs> friends who grew up um, uh, with uh, uh, some decent, uh, decent economic background, but 
you know, there there are some issues there too. So, I mean, Columbine wasn't in the city schools. So, you know, we have to be realistic when we look at if we're going to if we're going to help children, then we need to help children regardless of where they are, because they all need our help, regardless of what they look like or um, what their family background is. Um, there are some young people in our world who have uh, who have some issues um, that they're dealing with, and a lot of times you will probably be the only person that they will be um, willing to talk to, um, and someone who probably will be able to offer them the type of encouragement. Not only will you be someone who's, uh, excuse me, not only will you be someone who's uh, close to their age, and so they'll probably believe you more than they'll believe somebody old like me, um, because they'll tell me I'm, I'm not in tune with what's going on, um, but you will be someone who, who represents um, an opportunity uh, to uh, to advance and, and to get educated. Uh, I'm hoping, what, what time are we planning to be done today, 10.30? Because right, my students accuse me of being loquacious, and I don't know where they would learn a word like that. But <laughs> And I, I must say I can be guilty sometimes. Um, so I'm going to try and uh, I think I'm going to leave plenty of time for some question and answer, um, and I want you to feel free to um, to ask anything that is on your mind. There's nothing off limits. I said that at Cookstown University, and the students stood up and said, "Well, who should I vote for, Bush or Kerry?" You know, I said, "Well, I'm not going to answer." You know, she said, "Which one supports education?" So I'll avoid uh, the political questions, but uh, but anything as it relates to uh, to education, as to your goals, your plans as to what things that I encountered, you know, what, um, um, what kind, because there, I, I probably learned more my first year of teaching than I did in my entire life that I spent in school. Um, there's no teacher like experience, and that's like that, that's like that in, in any field, um, any career. Experience is your best teacher. And, um, and I had a, an assistant superintendent who told me early in my career, she said, um, if you're really truly going to help children, she said, you'll probably do something every day that you could probably get fired for, you know, and, and, and it's true, you know, if, if you've got to be a risk taker. And I'm not asking you to go out and get fired, you know, but just understand that there are just going to be so many things that are going to be required of you. I mean, to whom much is given, much is required. And, um, um, and these students are, are very, very, very needy. Many of them are growing up without positive male or female. You know, I was talking earlier how, you know, in many of our schools where there's a growing, the, the, the violence among females is growing. It used to be an issue with, with boys, but it's becoming a female issue more so. And I think it's because of, we're now seeing um, a greater impact of the disappearance of the woman in the home. Um, you know, we've had issues with alcohol and cigarettes and all kinds of other things, domestic abuse, but for some reason, women have been able to kind of make it through that middle passage. But um, this whole issue of drug abuse and AIDS has really begun to take, take a toll on the mothers and, 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 and many of the communities. And so we have children in, in many of our schools who are being raised by people who they aren't even related to and they don't know it. We have parents who've left children with neighbors and have never come back to get them um, uh, because it's just that they've had so many issues that, they, that they've had to deal with. So um, you will probably be somebody's mommy. You will be somebody's daddy. You know, who's your daddy? You know, they were those socks again, right? Um, and congratulations to you Red Sox fans. I understand they were fighting to get into Fenway last night. Um, but um, so often I have, uh, uh, many of my teachers will say, well, Mr. L, you know, social work is just not on my teaching certificate. Or nutritionists are not, because in our school we serve breakfast to all of our students. Um, we found that many of our students, uh, we had a, a, a before school breakfast program, and many of our students were running to get in the door um, after school started, you know. And, um, and we found that students were sleeping during the day, and students were not energetic, and, we, you know, we found there were students who talked about not even eating the night before. So and if, you, if you can't teach a hungry child, you can't teach a cold child, you can't teach a lonely child, you know. So uh, we just decided that as, as a staff and, and, you know, we had some issues with the union because the union felt that, you know, teachers are here to teach, they're not here to serve breakfast. 
you know, if a teacher said, well, what if we want to do it? What if we, we can't teach if we don't get these kids something to eat every morning? So we put a plan together and said, you know, why don't we take five to 10 minutes of every day, kids are putting their coats up, we'll go over some current events, we'll take roll, and while we're doing those sort of maintenance things, the kids can go in, grab a, uh, some uh, French toast or some juice or milk or something, so that we know that every child has had an opportunity to get something to eat, and it's made a difference. And I had some people from the Philadelphia Inquirer and Daily News say to me, and I didn't even think about this, they said, you know, um, actually, um, the year you guys started that, you made like, the, the district had a goal of like a 10% jump and, uh, and standardized test scores every year, and I think we went up like 18%. And, um, and they said, you, you, I said, well, nutrition is not that important, you know. Um, they said, I think that there probably was a boost in the self-esteem of the kids, because you actually had people with college degrees who were serving them food, who cared enough about the fact that they needed something to eat. These are people who traditionally are viewed as, when you, a lot of times you're viewed as an outsider sometimes because you're not from the community where you work, although you spend uh, much time there, um, but here's someone who cared enough about me and about my child to decide, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and make sure that, that they have something. I didn't think about that, the, uh, the emotional issue, the, the impact that would have on young people for us to make a decision that, that we know truly affected them. A lot of times in education, we make decisions that are important to us and um, not uh, uh, more so we don't think about well, how is this going to affect us. Uh, Students, I have many times teachers will come to me at the end of the year and say, you know, Mr. L, I think I want to teach uh, the lower grade. You know, I think, I said, lower grade, you're already in pre-K, where are you going to go? you be a midwife? You know. <laughs> but, um, you know, they, you know, teachers teach the fifth grade or fourth grade, and I think I want to teach second or first, and, I, and then I say, well, why? Are you somehow going to be the best teacher that they've ever had, and, you know, that you're going to bump your friend out of her, you know, her prized possession, her first grade job? Well, you know, I'm just struggling with the fifth and fourth grade, and I just, I think it'd be a little easier, you know. But what about those kids? What about those children? Those children, those early grades need the best teachers. If those kids are not at grade reading level, by third grade, only one in ten ever catch up. So where do those, where do those other nine go? We know where they go. They end up going to prison. Ninety percent of our prison population never on grade reading level male or female, juvenile or adult. So we need our best teachers. So please don't make a decision to go and work with a kindergarten, first, <coughs> second grade kid because you're looking for something easy to do because that is a tough work. And also I need to let you know something. There are some real discipline issues with some young kids. You know, it's, um, it's not um, a very easy job. Um, so we, um, we like to often talk about in our school making decisions that we know will um, uh, have the, uh, the, the most impact on, the, on our students. Um, I'll just uh, talk to you a little bit about, there were some things that I did not discuss last night because I knew we'd get together today, and we're signed kind of, we're more on the same page than the larger audience, so I wanted to talk to you about just uh, some of the goals that I have. I did talk about how reading is very important to me, and I've, I've noticed that students, if we can improve their reading, that it has impacted almost every, every, every aspect of their life. And, and so um, I just want to talk to you about a, a, a few things. Um, the NATE report, the National Association of Educational Progress, we call it the Nation's Report Card. Um, their, their research shows that the average reading scores for fourth, or eighth, fourth and eighth graders have pretty much been the same for the, the last 10 years. Uh, but uh, some various subgroups have shown improvement, um, and one being African American have shown an improvement in reading in fourth and eighth grade. Although um, not major improvements, there have been some improvements. But there's still a huge gap between rich and poor children. Um, and they're, they're also between white and Asian students and black, Hispanic, and Native American children, there's still a huge gap between those kids. And I often talk about it, and, and, and um, NAAP has a research, and they talk about how uh, in the education trust, uh, you, you need to visit some of these websites even, at, even before you become a professional. But uh, they talk about if, 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 if we could get students with good teachers for four years, it would, it would close the gap. It would close that achievement gap. We know there is, there is no single factor that's more important than a good teacher in the classroom. And I don't mean just loving your students. I don't mean walking in and saying, oh, I love my students. Because I know teachers who love their students and do not have high expectations for those students. You have to have high expectations. 
for those students. And then we as administrators, we have to support you in that endeavor. We have to fight to make sure that you, you don't have 30 kids in the classroom, that you're not fighting, that you're not, kids are not, uh, you don't have a lottery for who gets a book, you know, today. And we need to make sure that, that, that you feel safe, that your students feel safe. Those are all the things that you, you know, folks who are planning to become administrators, you've got to understand that, that your job is to make sure that those, when those teachers walk into your building every day, that they know that they're in a place where they are appreciated and that they will be able to teach. I mean, even if a, even if a teacher comes in and you hear that teacher with a slight cough, before that first hour is gone in, uh, in the school day, you go up there with a cup of tea, with some lemon, you give them, tell her, do not plan on going home today and, and be here tomorrow. You know, just um, just let them know that, that you care, you know what's going on, and, and you're in tune. Um, um, you know, be there. Uh, but your, your job, and this is why, uh, when I talk about, you know, this gap, this is why your job as, as, as teachers, as, um, as teacher educators, as aspiring teachers, social workers, uh, counselors, it's why your job is so, so, so important. And, and I don't raise this issue because I, I say that the needs of, uh, of suburban kids or, or inner city or rural kids are more important than another. I raise this issue because these children all are going to grow up in the same world that our children grow up in. You know, and so if we, we, my goal is to try, if I can make the world a better place, then I can kind of uh, make things a little better for my own daughter. And that is selfish. That is selfish. But I'm, I'm being realistic also that I'd much rather uh, go into a bank and be in line, you know, depositing my paycheck and have one of my former students in line depositing his or her paycheck than to have that kid waiting outside for me to deposit my paycheck in his pocket. So that means if I, if I just get this kid interested in school and it keeps this kid out of jail and, and keeps him working, then it's worth the, uh, it's worth, worth the ex extra effort. Um, and again, uh, you know, when we talk about getting kids, getting kids at grade reading level, I mean, there's, um, there's no better bang you know, for the buck. And I, and I talked a little bit last night about how independent reading is so important for trade books. Um, um, it's it's uh, it's phenomenal, and, and our students who who we see who read a lot, students who, who read a lot, um, our students who are more successful, our students who are successful in other areas in school, not just academically. We know that reading um, um, a lot of times is the only way students have a chance to travel. It's the only way students have a chance to experience so many little things um, is through reading. And those parents who provide those literate rich environments at home are parents who um, have just a much better experience at um, sending their kids to school every day um, and, and having them be successful. Um, now, the Program for International School Assessment, PISA, they have statistics that show that um, overall the U.S. is sort of in the middle of the pack compared to the reading of um, other countries. There were about 32 countries in the study. Um, overall, we're about in the middle of the pack. But if we extrapolate, now here's the gap. If we extrapolate the scores of white students the U.S. jumps to number two on the list of those 32 countries, number two. But if we take, in the same study, if we take the scores of African-American and Hispanic students, then we now rank 29th out of 32 countries. So you can see there's a huge gap. See, when we talk about educating, we talk about leaving no child behind, we talk about educating the entire country, then we, you know, we know that, that we have um, a lot of work to do, and again, we know it's not it's not rocket science, you know it's not rocket science. Um, but you know the wealthy families. Um, I talked about how uh, you know those schools have um, have issues um, with reading. Even in and I noticed in black middle class. I know we in, in Maryland, some parts of Maryland, um, there are traditionally some neighborhoods that are pretty much um, all black and all middle class, and that's something that's unique. You don't have many areas like that in the United States. But Maryland is unique for that. There's some uh, some areas in Montgomery County, Prince George's County, but but some studies have found that although that these neighborhoods are middle class, that there still have been some serious issues with schools and education that are similar to uh, problems that are going on in inner city areas. So although you know we may have progressed economically, we still have not moved in terms of educating our children. So we we need to continue. And I, and I often say to my colleagues, you know, when, when you go into a friend's home, if you really want to know what type of person you're friends with, is you look at the books that they're reading. See if they have any books. I mean, if they have all CDs and no books, 
And you know, they've got issues, you know, and, and, um, and you think about, you think about the kids, the young people that you know, think about yourself. You know, you, you have plenty of books in your home. So if a kid is coming from a home that has um, no books, and on average, poor, poor kids are coming from a home that have less than two books per home, while their, their, their counterparts are coming from homes that have 200 or more books. We know that, um, that because I know my mom, there were bookshelves, we were just, and you know, she would just go to thrift, thrift stores and yard sale and buy bookcases. We didn't have the matching bookcases. We had a black, black shelf hair, brown shelf hair, and you know, uh, blonde hair, you know, it's, it was just a place to hold books. We had boxes, but I learned early that reading, reading and research was, was, uh, was very important. Many of our schools, many of the schools where you will work will have students who uh, cannot read at the most basic level. Um, at least 60 to 70 percent of the students in many of these schools will not be reading at the basic level. So you, your, your work will be cut out for you when you arrive. You will have students who will seriously need, um, and, and, and with the way our educational system is set up now, it's not set up really to help those students. If, if we can't get those students early in kindergarten and first grade, when those students reach fourth grade, those students are not at, uh, at grade level. Those students begin to, to look at other ways to gain respect from their, from their peers. And that's why you begin to see the, the, uh, the discipline problems. The students who, especially the males, who were honor students many times um, up until third, fourth, fifth grade, going to middle school and begin to look for that identity. The gangs begin to be, begin to be their family. You know, and um, so we've got to kind of get involved in, 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 I call it prevention instead of intervention. We've kind of got to get those kids before they get into those gangs, before they start to, to, to hang around with those guys and get them to understand that, no, you're a successful student. Continue with that. Come back. Let me know how you're doing. Let me be a part of your life. You know, mentor some of these students, even when these students leave you. You know, let them know when you go on to another school. I'm here for you. You need tutoring. You need any help. I know I'm asking you to put in more time after school, but, um, but it's the only way, really, that many of these students are going to make because you will probably be the only person who has actually volunteered to help the student outside of the uh, typical school day. Uh, most of the research uh, uh, with these students um, in terms of uh, uh, prison population and uh, reading levels, um, uh, most of it is, um, implies that the difference is in reading experience. Uh, most of these students who are successful just have had um, a different background in reading. Uh, middle class children enter, enter kindergarten having been read to for over 1,700 hours. 1,700 hours. Children from high poverty or poor areas have been read to 25 hours in their lifetime before they enter school. So you can imagine the experience. Um, my, my kindergarten teachers, every year I, I see them right away. They can point out the kids who are going to be in the top reading group when they get into fourth and fifth grade. Now, they don't label on the kids, they don't say that the kids are gonna fail, but they immediately know in kindergarten which children are going to be in the top reading group in fourth or fifth grade. How do you think they know? Because those are the students who say, oh, I know that book, I recognize that book. They even know some of the titles of the book. Oh yes, my parent reads that book to me. They are already sometimes, when you're reading the book, they're, they're reading with you. Those are the children who you know have already had that experience, that literacy is emerging already. Those students are going to be high level readers. Unfortunately, many of our students are not getting those experiences at home. So what we do as educators, and I've been guilty of it, is we ask students when they come to school, how come you aren't reading at home? When we know it's just not the culture, you know, it's not the, the, the environment, is not conducive to those young people reading. So we've got to, to actually uh, create experiences in school, environments in school where those students can read independently, give them a quiet corner. If a kid wants to read during lunch or whatever, you know, don't, don't ban them, banish them to the schoolyard or the lunchroom, or, you know, give, even if he wants to take a book to the lunchroom read, let's encourage that. Let's get those students, students reading. Now, as you can see, because many of them just don't have the experience of um, having someone, you know, read to them. Um, as educators, and I talked about this last night, that we have to get into the habit of teaching children the habit of reading. We've got to show them, we've got to let them know that we read. And we've got to show them that reading is important, allowing them to read um, an hour a day. But students should be students who are successful, high school students and college students who are studying, 
Uh, the students who are most successful read for at least an hour a day. How much does the average student in school read now independently? I won't even allow you to guess. The average is seven minutes per day. Seven minutes per day on average. And, um, and, and uh, you know, I, I, there's a researcher, uh, Terrence Paul, did a study with uh, over 600,000 students. And, um, and I think, um, uh, and, and, um, and, I'm, and I'm not going to quote it, but if I'm not mistaken, I think the top 5% the top of students read almost 100 more times than the bottom 5%. So, you know, it's clear that the students who do well just read a whole lot more than the students who don't. So, um, um, and, you know, and I hate to keep banging this drum, but I am, uh, and, I, and I was a math teacher. You know, I, I was a mathematics teacher, and I, you know, I actually started using this chess to, uh, to teach kids mathematics, but I know that many of my students couldn't read the book. So I had to go, you know, I had to start, I had to start, I, I actually had to learn to become a reading teacher just to be able to, uh, to help my students. Um, and, 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 and I know the research uh, uh, and, and with chess is it's just unbelievable. In the United States, it's the only industrialized nation that does not have chess as a part of its national curriculum. We're the only one, Canada, Mexico, Europe, everyone does it, you know, but us. So I'm um, working with the foundation in Seattle. We're going to implement a curriculum for teachers. Every second and third grade classroom, children are going to learn chess. 9.2 million children at no cost to school. We're going to make Gates, Costco, Starbucks. I just met with these folks in Seattle. They're going to pay for this. You know, we, we, you know, the students don't have to be competitive players. But if we can get those students critically thinking, problem solving, reasoning, you know, chess teaches them patience. Students who play chess have higher SAT scores. Um, UMBC has an excellent chess program. I know they've kind of been importing players, you know, from some underground tunnel. Uh, uh, and uh, my, some of my students have kind of fallen by the wayside. These are students who are very good students, but they somehow can't find a way to get some of these scholarships. Even, you know, we have some schools at the middle school, middle school level that are actually recruiting players from Russia to come in and, for middle school to play chess. Um, so it's, it's, it's not just football and basketball. I mean, it's, um, it's, it's permeated into the debates and the chess and that kind of thing. Um, the recruiting is heavy. But, um, but the research is so sound on, on, on what it does for a young person. Um, and, and the skills are transferable. And, and really, it's with after-school programs, period. And I don't mean particularly just extending the school day, come after school, let's continue what we did during the day, or let's get that homework done. I mean activities that are going to enrich students. Activity where students are going to gain experiences that they don't normally get. You know, maybe it's an activity where, you know, you say, listen, we're going to go and visit a horticultural center. We're, you know, we're going to go to a museum. We're going to go and do something you don't normally do. I'm going to bring someone in from the zoo to talk to you about zoology or, you know, bring people in to talk to you about engineering. Those are the types of things that we need to give. And we don't have enough time in the school day. We're eliminating recess and lunch so that we can test kids more. So we need to find ways to give kids the arts and music things that they, that they need, and, and so a lot of times those opportunities are after school, and I hate to say it, on weekends. So, um, so sometimes, you know, we actually started a Saturday morning. I started in my mom's home because the school district wouldn't allow me to uh, bring kids into the school, and then they finally uh, allowed us to open up the school, and then we had kids who were coming in on Saturday, and at my mom's memorial service two years ago, there were a large number of students who actually attended her memorial service who were part of that Saturday program, and um, some of them had um, had already graduated college. A few were in grad school, and and um, and then he stood up and just kind of talked about how. Uh, and I had actually forgotten that we had started the program in her in her home. I was just trying to get a free meal from her, and um, so I said, "Do you think I could bring these kids in?" And she said, "Sure, bring them." I said, "You're gonna cook, right?" She said, "Yeah, I'll cook." Um, and um, but you know, of course, so she said, "Yeah, but you gotta allow me to do some of the teaching too. You can't just be principal. Allow me to do some of the stuff." Um, it was a um, it was a wonderful experience for those students um, to um, you know some of them have, have no relationships with grandmoms or whatever so you are, your students will want to know about your family regardless of who you are what you look like they're gonna want to know about your mom your dad your sisters your brother they want to know because some of them don't have a sense of family you know so your family will in essence become their family your experiences will become their experiences they'll be richer for what you have shared with them. It, it is your ability to offer that culture, that diversity, that will make those students, um, that will put them, place them 
you know, in, in a much better position to be successful because we know what the world is like. And so um, just know that, that there are students who are waiting for you to come in and just offer them just, just a ray of hope, just a, um, an idea that, that things can, uh, things can be uh, a lot better, that there's a light at the end of the tunnel and it's not a train, you know, that, um, that with education, uh, they can be successful. I often, you know, say to students that education is your only salvation. When you're rich, when you're fluent, you have options. But when you're poor, you know, you, you have to educate yourself. And you can decide to do anything you want, but no one will ever be able to take that education from you. It empowers you. It gives you the ability to, to tell the truth from lies. It just it gives you uh, so much more authority. So um, you, you are in the position to be able to offer that um, to young people, that, that avenue you know, to education. And uh, I appreciate you for taking that bold step because I know there's no person in this world who has a tougher job than an, uh, than an educator. The only man or woman that has a tougher job than you is the man or woman who's trying to find Bin Laden right now. It's the only one. You know, you will be saving Private Ryan every day. There are young people who will be the last in their family to have opportunity to get a college degree. And you, you know, you will be, you mean, you'll be dodging bullets and landmines and, and all types of issues and situations trying to get those students to understand that their goal is to get to Penn State and not the state Penn. So I'm done with my presentation, and what I'd like to do is um, answer any questions that you have. And if you don't have any questions, then I'm going to read to you, and you don't want me to read to you. <laughs> yes, ma'am. And, and just real quick, if you don't hear the question, I'll repeat it for you, okay? Okay. <laughs> See that that's uh, that's what happens when people come and hear you speak prior to your presentation, and they want to. And then when you leave something out, they call you on it. <laughs> uh, but it lets me know you were listening and, and not uh, and not asleep. But um, yeah, my career, uh, actually, my educational as a student, you know, I just remember um, um, as a third grader where um, uh, my mother you know, was raising uh, eight children as a, as a single parent. And she walked in um, to my um, elementary uh, classroom. My third grade teacher was a young white female. Miss Pettit was her name. And, and, um, and you know, she just said, I need help. You know, I, I, you know I'm, I'm raising eight children. Uh, I often, I joke because uh, my father's name was William, but we would joke and call him Randolph because he ran off and left my mother with all those children. <laughs> but um, I'm glad he never heard of it. But, um, um, you know, and my teacher, you know, she had, she was, you know, she wasn't from the community um, where, where we lived, and she had every reason to say to my mom, you know, listen, I, I have to educate these 25, 30 students. I don't have time to give you in the bill. I can't help you. You know, my, my, my certification is not K through adult, you know. It's K to 5. It's elementary. But she didn't do that. That's not what teachers do. You know, she worked with my fourth grade teacher, and they helped her get me into um, a gifted school, the Masterman School, it's one of the top schools in Philadelphia and in Pennsylvania. And uh, my, my fourth grade teacher was an uh, older African American female and she um, had a dance group and so she would take us out. They began to get me involved in, in many activities. And um, at the time, I didn't know that they had ulterior motives, you know, but these were people who basically made a commitment and a sacrifice to help, um, to help a parent who needed help. And I often, uh, when I talk to my parents, I, I talk about how my mother had a teachable spirit. See, you know, and as a parent, when the parents come into your classroom, parents have to come in, if they want your help, they've got to come in and allow you to help them. They've got to allow you to help their children. Now, I have them to come in my school all the time and tell me what they don't, what I'm not going to do and what I am going to do. And they come in and say, well, I don't like your program. You know, I say, well, if your program was working, I wouldn't have to use mine, you know. So, um, but they, you know, but for my mother to allow these strangers you know, to help her, and, and it's, it's, it's no, you know, it's no secret to me or to other people in my family that these teachers saved my life because of my mother's eight children. I'm the only one to go to college and graduate, you know, so I, I really appreciate the effort that, that was made, um, and I also think that part of it was the fact that I developed a relationship with these ladies. I stayed in touch with them. When I graduated high school and graduated college and didn't have a job, I called those teachers and said, you talked me into going to college. And I'm graduating and don't have a job. You know, now what are you going to do? 
She said, well, you're the one that doesn't have a job. I have a job, you know. You know, but she helped me get a job in television and, um, you know, went in and talked to some kids about my job in TV. And those kids said to me, you know, listen, you know, uh, um, if you come in and motivate us, how come you aren't a teacher? You know, and I, I thought about that. And, and, and um, it was a very powerful question because I was becoming the type of person that I often complained about. Someone who was selfish and concerned about his own career. I went into my TV job and quit and um, enrolled in graduate school, got certified to teach. And those same, went to that same high school, those students said, uh, you know, Mr. Dell, you were a fool to leave that TV job, you know. But, um, but it, it, was, um, you know, it was at that time that, you know, even as a youngster, that I realized the, uh, the power of influence um, um, as teachers, as educators, um, as role models, as mentors that we have. And, um, and, I, and I, I don't know if my teachers had ever thought about the fact that I would become a teacher. But I'm sure that, um, that as a teacher, you hope that, you know, maybe one of my students will want to grow up. And I'm sure when I, when I walked into my, my former high school, you know, uh, as a teacher, I mean, I could just see the look on the faces of some of those folks. I mean, because I was one of the kids that stayed in the principal's office, you know. Uh, I was a, a real prankster. And, um, and uh, I mean, they were just proud. You know, you're proud to see one of your own. And I, I, we've already begun a conversation. I think when I come back, I'm going to bring some of those kids that you read about in the book. I'm going to bring them with me so you can hear the testimony from those young people. See, I, because, see, I, I often say this story is not about me. Now, you, you hear me bragging a lot, but I'm bragging because I'm proud of what my students have accomplished. I'm proud of them. Because, see, if we don't put a positive spin on what we do, the media will take it, and, and they'll, they'll spin it so much on the negative side that we'll never recover. You know, you, 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 won't, you, you have kids who are successful, and you'll never see the news. But there'll be one incident, and it'll be on every news station in the city. And so if we continue to highlight the negative, the students will want to, they'll want that negative um, exposure, because at least they're getting that 15 seconds or 15 minutes. So, um, um, you know, we, we need to put that. But I'm going to bring, uh, I'm going to bring Otis, you know, who just graduated from law school. I'm going to bring Demetrius and Denise and all, and all those kids here. So um, that you can see, you can see the evidence of uh, of what happens, and you you'll begin to see. So you you now will have a rubric. You you'll say, okay, now I know when I start teaching, you'll tell your students right away. Now I met some kids, and I know what I have the power to do. So you grow up and go to college, and you come see me, so we can go back to Salisbury and let these folks know that um, that um, you know they earned their money. You know, but it, it's um it, it's 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 a positive message and and um and when those students are out and they're successful it's a reflection of you when they come back to school when you go back to visit you don't go visit that teacher that didn't challenge you you don't visit the teacher that watched jerry springer when he should have been teaching you how to solve quadratic equations you don't go see the person that allowed you to to walk around in the building with your hat on all day or to use profanity you don't go you go see that person who you complained about quite often but you know that that person really loves you because love is a form of discipline. And you know that, um, that this is a person who told me, you know, no, no, you can't just have a vision. You have to have a plan. You can't just talk about where you want to go. See, a vision without a plan is an hallucination. So we can talk about wanting to be doctors and lawyers, or, but what are you doing? Are you studying? Are you on the honor roll? Are you involved in the extracurricular activities? What is your plan? Where are you going to college? What are you going to do? Have you taken your senior? You haven't taken the SAT. What are you going to do? You know, those people who will always ask you those questions, those people who are always constantly nagging you, those are the people who I go back. Because believe me, these students that are successful now, they were not very nice to me when they were in school. I'm telling you right now, I tell you the nice stories. I don't tell you the stories of when I was taking kids to Florida and then they told me, we wish you weren't on this trip. You know, when I asked them, well, how would you be here if I wasn't here? You know, um, uh, there was one of my kids who, you know, I'd gotten into the high school for engineering and science. It's one of the, uh, one of the few schools in Philadelphia where every kid goes to college every year, almost every child on a full scholarship. So he goes to this school and he's struggling. So he tells his mother to take him out of the school. So his mother calls me and says, you know, Earl wants to, you know, get out of the school. You know, and I tell his mother, well, you didn't get him in there. I did. So if he comes out of there, I take him out, you know? And I said, well, let me rephrase that because you are his mother. I said, but Earl needs to be at the school. He wants to go to another school. He wants to play basketball. He wants to, uh, he wants to get straight A's. He, wants, he doesn't want a challenge. 
But that young man, a, a, a diploma from this school means so much more than a diploma from another school. Sure, he's not accustomed to, to teachers who every day are challenging him and, and pressing him. He's not accustomed to that. So it's going to take some, some getting used to. I said, but you leave. I'm begging you. Leave Earl there. You know, Earl called me. You're not my father. How can you? I mean, laid me out. But see, Earl's, Earl's in college now. Now Earl, now, Earl is one of the few chess players who didn't go on a scholarship, and he wanted to go to the same college that his chess, his uh, teammates went to. So the college told him, in order for you to come, you have to come as a non-scholarship student. You know, and so what I told Earl is, you think about the energy that you spent years ago telling me that I wasn't your father, complaining, wanting to go to another school, and now think about that. Because now you have to go, and now you have to pay. Your parents have to bear. you got to rely on financial aid, which is decreasing every day. You know, um, but I think about how, you know, and, 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 but, but now Earl has just been offered a full scholarship at this college now. After he spent a year there, they have now offered him a full scholarship. And I told Earl, you know, um, uh, you know they, with, they, with, with, um, um, there has to be some sacrifice. If you're going to be successful, there's going to be some sacrifice. And I said to him, you know, what if I had succumbed to you? Because I wanted to. It, it was, I'm telling you, that was tough for me to watch him suffer and to think that here's a kid that's saying to me, you're not my father, you're not my daddy, you know, you're not my mom. I want to get out of this school, but you won't allow me to come out of this school, you know. And, and it, it, was, it was troubling for me, but I knew it was the best place for him, you know. And, um, and now um, he made it through. He made it through. He didn't make it through with straight A's. He was accustomed to being a straight A school student, but he came from a school where he wasn't being challenged. These people were challenging him. And so, and now he's in college. He's now on a scholarship. Um, and it didn't really dawn on me how this affected him until one day I was um, uh, at some presentation and then uh, they asked Earl to introduce me. You know, I thought that, you know, the dean or somebody was going to introduce me. And they asked Earl to introduce me. And I said, Earl, are you okay? You need my bio? And he was like, no, I'm, I'm on fine, Mr. L. And then Earl came up, and he told this story of how he wanted to leave the school, and I wouldn't allow him to leave. And it was very, it was very, very, it touched me because I never really knew, we never really talked about that. I never really knew how he felt. And he just talked about how if I had made that decision that he probably wouldn't be there today where he was. You know, and, and it, was, it, was, it was powerful for me because there are times when you sometimes are going to, you know, you just aren't going to think that you're making a difference. You're going to think that you're making decisions that, that are going to be tough on kids. Um, and then you're going to want to relent. You're going to want to give up and say, oh, you know, maybe I should ease up. Maybe I shouldn't challenge them. But if we make it easy on them now, it will be much harder for them later on. And I told Earl afterwards, I said, Earl, I'm proud of you, number one, to be able to talk to other people about that. Because I know as a young person, I probably would have been embarrassed just to talk about wanting to be in a, in, a, in, a, uh, in a less stressful environment. I said, but to talk about how you've now used that as a positive, as something that has motivated you to want to uh, do better. And of course, you know, Earl's a 3-0 student now in college. And, and, um, and you know, his mother, his mother doesn't really talk often about it, but I'm sure that you know, there probably was some tension there also because there's something about the relationship between a mother and her son. And I know that Earl probably was able to, I'm sure that she probably told Earl, I'm going to call Mr. L and he's going to take you out of that school. And then she probably got on the phone with me and I probably convinced her that he was not going to move. But I just gave you that example as um, basically a way to show you that, that there, are going to be, uh, there are going to be times when you're going to have to be real tough on those students. And sometimes tough on your parents because they'll want to make decisions. They'll want to, sometimes they may want to move a kid from your room, you know, because you somehow, this year, you're the teacher who's going to require that this student steps it up. And that student said, you know what? I'm not dealing with that. Nobody's ever really told me to do anything that I didn't want to do. Mom, take me out of her classroom. And that parent's going to walk in and say, I want my kid out of your room. They're going to ask you one, one, one question about what's going on. That child's gonna go home and say, I want out. That parent's gonna walk into your room and say, I want out. And you owe it to that child to say to that parent, why? Question her, challenge her. Get them to understand that you're making the decision based on your student, your child's feelings, but it might not necessarily be good for that child. So, you know, a lot of times, your, your, those decisions are, 
uh, that you are going to make are, are not just going to be uh, uh, mathematics and, um, and language arts. You know, you're going to be making decisions that are going to, it could affect the future of, uh, of, uh, of our young people. And so there's a lot of responsibility that comes with these positions, whether it's inside the classroom, outside the classroom, whether you're working with homeless children, whether you're working in social service, whatever it is, is, is much responsibility that comes with um, having uh, the lives of your children in your hand. You'll be shaping their lives at a young age. Now, you said the story of Demetrius. Um, now, now, Demetrius would like me to tell you the story of the first time he beat me in a chess match because he ran around the school and told everybody I beat Mr. L. But I think you wanted me to talk about Demetrius defeating his expert level play, which he still talks about. Um, actually, he gets in front of the camera, in front of me sometimes, and he says, no, interview me. Um, but um, um, but I, I talked last night about, um, um, there was a tournament in, in Virginia that I was going to take some students to. It was Valentine's Day weekend, and, uh, and you know, of course, my wife wasn't happy about that, but she was going to allow me to go to this tournament and come back on Sunday and celebrate Valentine's Day, but this tournament was canceled because of snow. And um, so there was one other tournament in New Jersey, in Parsippany, New Jersey, North Jersey. This tournament ended on a Monday. And uh, my students said, well, we can go to the tournament in Parsippany. And um, Demetrius was one of the kids. He had just been evicted from his home. His teachers had gone out and purchased clothes. They, they, you know, they wanted him to, to go away on his trip and that, because he didn't know where he was, he was staying with an older sister, but he didn't know where he was actually going to live. This is a kid that lived in three different homes uh, in, in like two years. Um, so, you know, it was important for him to get away. So, you know, I, I, I told the kids, well, I know Demetrius wants to get away, but, you know, my wife is not going to allow me to come back on Monday on Valentine's Day weekend. And the kids said, well, you know, let, we'll call your wife. I think it was Earl who said, you know, I'll call your wife. And I was like, no, you're not going to call my wife. <laughs> so I called my wife, and, uh, you know, I, I put the bag on. I said, listen, please. She said, no, make a decision for us. And um, But I didn't. I chose to take the kids to the tournament. This was, uh, ladies, you know, that was big trouble, right? Uh, but this was um, the largest team versus team event in the world, larger than the Olympics, 220 teams, U.S. Amateur East Championship. And the kids beat Bucknell University's chess team, their first match. And then the next day, Demetrius was matched up against an expert-level player. And um, Demetrius had defeated this expert-level player, had never, a novice player had never defeated an expert-level player in 35 years of U.S. chess history something that had never been done. You know, and here's a kid's father's in jail, mother lives in South Carolina and being raised by a sister. But he has the, the presence of mind, you know, the wherewithal to do something that had never been done before. You know, you think about all the kids who've come through who have grown to become chess masters, and here's a kid who's just a novice playing less than two years. And, um, you know, of course, they put Demetrius' name on the wall and lights. They want to treat the kids to dinner and at the hotel restaurant. And I told the guy, no, you don't want to treat these kids to dinner in your restaurant. I tried to talk him into going to McDonald's, but he wouldn't have it. Uh, so I met with the kids and said, well, go in. It's a fancy restaurant. If you can't pronounce it, don't order it. So of course they went in and ordered some that McDonald's, crab biscuit, and, you know. But the kids went on to uh, win first place in the tournament. Um, I didn't call home all weekend, so you know, I was in big trouble when I arrived home with all those trophies. But. Um, but um, also that weekend was a pivotal moment in my life. I, I realized that I, I needed to be more committed to my wife and to my family as, 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 as future educators, um, um, as future uh, mentors, role models, you know, whoever you are. If, you, if you're involved in the community, you're going to be spending some time outside of your home. And, um, and we need to uh, make sure that we take care of um, the folks at home that take care of us. I know I'm, I have uh, my wife and I have two babies and I have a new baby, she's eight months old. Uh, she was born three months early, a pound, 13 ounces. Um, she's now 18 pounds, she's doing well. Um, but you know, my, she, she was in the hospital 84 days. And to see, uh, you know, to see my wife who had been in the hospital 20 days prior to my daughter's birth, to see what she went through as a mom, you know, it just, um, it helped me really, fellas, to understand how powerful women are and how strong they are. These are some powerful people. Um, and also, I said to myself that, you know, we, we really need to make sure that we, we treat these women as such. You know, I, I have a, a strong appreciation for the sacrifices that my wife makes to allow me to, to do what I do. And she understands the, the mission 
and um, and uh, she understands the, the passion and the testimony um, and the ministry. But it, it is a sacrifice, and so you know we have to. And ladies, you know if you if you're an educator, you know we often say you know as teachers we we live at work and we and we, we, we work at home, you know. But to make that time for for your spouse, for your children, because it's an, it's important. And it, um, it also makes you a better person, you know, and also continue to go to school. I'm, I'm always saying, you know, to, to anyone that I work with that if we don't improve ourselves, we can't improve anyone else. So please continue. I have some, believe it or not, I have some teachers, some 20-year teachers who don't have a master's degree yet, you know, and that's just, um, it's no, because those students, are, they'll ask you, you know, you have your master's yet, you know? Uh, then they'll go, they'll go to college and they'll say, you know, I have my master's, you have Continue to uh, continue to go to school, improve yourself. You know, be on the cutting edge. You know, read the research, study, find out. You know, when I, you know, I often say to, to, to my staff uh, when they come to me and say, "Oh, I'm getting the the Williams kid. I heard he was terrible last year and he can't read." And you know, and I say, if someone came to you and told you that your own child had a disease that wasn't curable, would you just believe it and just say, you know, that be done with it? No, you get a second opinion, you get a third opinion. You go on the internet, you do some research, you should have that same mentality when someone comes to you and says, I'm sending you a kid, nobody can do anything with that child. You say to yourself, you know what? I'm gonna be the one person who uses a different key. I'm gonna unlock some door for this kid that's gonna get him to understand that I'm here to help him. I, you know, I'm not going to allow whatever he or she did in the past to impact what I'm gonna to offer to the young person. And, and a lot of times you'll find that kids will say, okay, this is somebody that's thinking a little differently, you know, and then you'll you'll um, you'll see that they'll begin to, to think differently. But um, but but get out there and and and, um, and be on top of what's going on because every year things change and, and you are really probably going to be the only ray of hope for many uh, many of those young people. Did I did I tell that story? You know, Demetrius, okay. You know, Demetrius is in college on a full four year scholarship, and then seeing Demetrius was was my only kid that was accepted into this high school for engineering and science. He has been a big write-up in, in, uh, in the Inquirer magazine about what he had done in Parsippany, and so engineering and science said, we have got to have this kid. You know, then I looked through all these applications of my kids that they had rejected, you know, and I said, listen, again, I did this without talking to Demetrius' family. I went and met with the principal, and I talk about it in the book, because she, she passed away before the book came out, and I dedicated the book to her. But I went to her, and I said, listen, if you don't take these other kids, you don't get Demetrius. And she said, have you talked to his parents about that? I said, yes, I have. <laughs> so if you want Demetrius, you have to take. And she, um, and, and she, took, she took the kids, and, um, and, and you know, she said, I, you know, the mayor's children and all these politicians, there's so much pressure for me to get these kids into the school. And, and, uh, but these kids went into the school. They ended up being National Honor Society students. These are students that they didn't accept. They outperformed many of the students that they had, they had taken in and uh, they become members of the, uh, they had a, uh, a group of students who were going to study, to go on to medical school from high school and, and um, they were part of this group. And then, you know, she said to me, she said, you know, I'm glad I took those kids. I said, yeah, I'm glad too, because you know, actually I had talked to Demetrius' family. I just, uh, I just knew that you really wanted them and, um, and I needed these kids to be together. And all of those students from that school all went on to the same high school. You know, because see, our problem a lot of times with minority kids is a lot of times they get into college, but they won't finish. You know, they, there's a there's a, a problem with retaining these students. So if we can get them to sort of go together, so they can kind of support one another. And then what I'm also teaching them is that when you get on the campus, is that you don't form your own clique and not interact with anyone else. So they're on campus, they're running for office, they're involved with other you know other students and, and that kind of thing. And then that's that's what what's important is finding ways to get those students there. And then as a teacher, that you, you, you know, your job never ends. You know, they'll call you, they'll need money for books. They call me and say, oh, I need $150 for a book. I said, you know, a book doesn't cost $150. Does it, student? Yeah. It does? I better send that check. <laughs> that was months ago. But things have changed, haven't they? You know, I remember, I remember when I could get my, all my books for a semester for $150. I'm, I'm in the PhD program now, and I, for one course, I think I spent $400 for books for one course. I'm gonna file. I'm gonna go to law school and file a lawsuit against that professor. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so they'll. I mean, they'll call you. They stop by my house on the way back to on the way to college. 
I just need to borrow a couple hundred dollars, I, you know. And my wife's like, you didn't give him any money. No, I didn't give him any money. No. <laughs> any other questions? Come on, somebody. Anybody but a dead body. Yes. Excellent. Number one, you listened last night. Number one, what is your name? Did everybody hear her question? Okay. Our professor, she gets an A this semester, okay? Excellent, excellent question. Um, because, well, number one, those trips to Vermont and Parsippany, those trips are educational. Those students are not skiing. They're not, you know, scuba diving. These students, it's a wonderful, it's a valuable experience. Um, but the school district has never given us a dime for these students to travel. Our money has, the only money we get are from churches, uh, people in the community, corporations. We get some, uh, uh, um, we kids at colleges have like fundraisers, teachers have fundraisers. Uh, what I don't allow the student to do is to go door to door and fundraise. Um, we've had issues with student kids getting abducted and abused, that kind of thing. So we don't allow that. But, um, but we, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger, when Denise beat him in that chess match, he wrote a check for $20,000. We immediately purchased blazers for all of our students with the school name and embroidered. We purchased luggage because we had some students who were traveling with plastic bags, you know, um, and so we purchased luggage for our students. Um, but we've, um, but, but our school district, they, they, they will fund sports, you know, and, and, I, and I, I've never asked the school district for money because I know that that money should go in the books and, you know, and those types of other things. But I think the city finds ways to fund so many other projects that you would think that um, you know um, activities where students are being challenged to use their mind, where students are able to meet students from other cultures and travel, you think that they will find money to be, now they'll give us all the citations in the world. They always want, they invite the kids to the mayor's office, invite them, they use them for photo ops and all kinds of things, but never write a check. Never say, you know, that was a wonderful trip. How much did that trip cost? You know, we get, Ten, we get old elderly grandmothers that will send ten one dollar bills in the envelope and say, you know, I read about the kids in the paper, and I, you know, I, I'm always, I'm a firm believer that if we stick by kids, they can be successful. Take this last ten dollars and use it. Buy a kid whatever you know, whatever he needs or whatever. And and uh, but we get a good number of people, you know, who do that. And uh, we we've raised um, considerable because you can imagine a trip where kids are traveling, uh, you know, across the Atlantic Ocean and uh, you know, kids traveling the West Coast. I mean, we'll spend ten, fifteen thousand dollars, you know, one trip, and this is just maybe eight, ten, twelve kids. You know, we'll go. I mean, you know, we're piling four or five kids in a hotel room, but um, you know, these kids have, have been to Florida playing, you know, chess tournaments. So we've um, um, we've never we've never requested money from the school because we know that they are you know more uh, you know pertinent important issues. But I, I think that they should be able to find. Um, you know, especially when you look at the graduation rates for, um, you know, and I was an athlete, so I'm not against athletics, but the graduation rate for, uh, for many of the especially males um, in athletics is not, um, is not very high. You know, it's, um, those, some of those numbers are starting, I mean, less than 50%. So um, when you look at um, programs where you're, you're getting a, a decent bang for your buck, you think we'd be able to find, uh, find some money for that, but, but we haven't. We have some corporations that have kind of uh, stepped up to the plate a little bit and said, you know, we, because they realize that these students are potential employees. So they say, you know, let's invest. Let's, um, let's kind of work together. Maybe we can um, find ways to motivate our employees the way, you know, you guys have been able to motivate these kids to overcome some obstacles. So we've gotten some support from some uh, corporate, uh, corporate giants, too. Did that answer your question? I know it was a five-minute response to a five-second question. But yes, sir. Oh, man, these are some great questions. You want the truth or you want the answer because I have a, a, a retired principal here? You want the truth. Can you handle the truth? I'm going to tell you right now, sir, there are many days when I say tomorrow I'm going to be back in the classroom. You know, it's um, working with adults is a lot tougher than working with young people. I expect kids to act like kids. I don't expect adults to act like children. 
And I, um, and there are many days when, I mean, it's just unbelievable. My cafeteria staff is fighting. You know, I have a teacher who, you know, who wants to write a kid up because um, a desk fell on his foot and he said, damn, you know, I mean, what? I'm glad he didn't say a few other things, you know. Um, it's just, um, you know, it's, um, it's um, you know, they, you know, they, they, you know, we have folks that, you know, they, they're notorious for showing up, pick up the kids late or coming to work late. But as soon as the kid walks in the class two seconds late, they want to write up all these referrals, you know. And children, they watch us. They learn from us. You know, it's, um, and then, you know, when I'm dealing with them, there's some folks that, you know, and it's not, now I have some wonderful teachers that I work with every day, and that's the reason why I'm still a principal. Because I, because every day when I think about going in the classroom, then one of those teachers comes in and says, you know, thanks for being here. You know, you know, I really appreciate you going the extra mile to try to do whatever you did. And I don't even know what it is. You know, there are people who you're going to work with who are going to say to you, you know, thanks for listening to me. Thanks for being there for me. You aren't even going to know this because you're going to say, man, I have my own issues. How about listen to someone else? But there are people who are going to come to work simply because you're there every day. You don't judge them. You're there to support them. You're not the person who's in the faculty room who's always involved with saying negative things about kids. And the kids know to listen to fact what goes on in the faculty room. Believe me. You know, um, so, uh, when, you know, when someone comes in and, and, and just says that, then I realize that, you know, this is an important job, too. And it's a job that's not easy because when people share things with me, I can't really share with anyone else. So it kind of separates me a little bit. And I was concerned about, you know, when I started thinking about becoming administrator, People would say, well, you're not going to have any interaction with the kids, and, and, I, and I, I didn't want that. So that's why I continued the chess program, and, you know, you know we, these, the trip we took the kids to Vermont, I went with those kids, you know, to Vermont. And, and the principal there, he came to spend a week with us. He brought his kids down from Vermont. Um, it's important. If I didn't have those types of activities, I probably wouldn't, uh, wouldn't be in the position. I mean, I, I, I have to have the interaction because it lets me know that I'm important. You know, but it, it's, a, it's a tough job. But it's one that, um, where we need uh, we need some good people to get in there and support those teachers because those good teachers need if they can get the right support and the right help uh, you know they can really 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 um, get it done and the education trust you know, they, did, they did a survey of about 1,400 high poverty schools and um, these were schools that all had outperformed their suburban counterparts and they looked at um, what um, the three common aspects all three schools had and each one they all had wonderful, excellent teachers in the classrooms who cared. Um, they had uh, parents who were heavily involved, and they all had good principals. They all had administrators who were dedicated, who were there to support those teachers, and, um, and who also who were knowledgeable, you know. And um, those were the three common things. So um, the question, the answer to your question is, um, I enjoyed it more as a teacher. It's probably, there's probably no greater feeling than, you know, it's what, I mean, because you're a king. You know, you're the king. You know, I, I mean, there's no one's leaving this room uh, with an education if they don't come through me, you know. And so you, you, feel, you feel empowered. And when you finally, you know, and, and every student in that room is not going to believe you. So it's going to take some work. That's where the creativity comes. And that's why I don't like these scripted programs that they're forcing on school. Just, it's good if you're new and you kind of need a little guidance, but it, does, it takes away from your creativity. So, um, and that's where you, you get, especially as a young man, because you, many times as men, you're going to walk into a school building where there may only be one or two men working in the building. So, you know, you, you come into my building every day, we'll be talking about the game. We'll find some time to, to bond a little bit because I'm in the building with about 70, 80 women, you know, and, uh, and it is hard. <laughs> you know, to talk about Emerald and you know, Guiding Light. And what are we going to do with all my children? They're so young and restless, they're going to end up in General Hospital. But it, it's, uh, and, and you know, and I, and I hear many other administrators, you know, they get upset and they say, I'm going back to the classroom, you know, because that, that's the sanctuary. That's, we know that's where it's pure. That's where, it, you know, it, it's really, 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 uh, we know the job is done. And, 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 um, and it just feels good, you know, for, and I, that's why I always encourage my students to say, just say thank you. They don't say thank you enough. I said, just say thank you to your teacher. And you, and you want to make a smile, just say thank you. And, uh, and uh, because it, you know, there, there, there's, we, we have some dark days as educators where, you know, um, even when we're working with adults, you know, we don't, we don't really truly know if we're, we're making a difference in your lives, even, even as college students. Sometimes we wonder if, um, you know, if this is really our calling and this is really where we should be. And then, you know, one of you comes up and says, you know, 
thanks for this or you know you you asked that question that we've been trying to get you to ask for for quite some time or you know maybe you finally begin to study you know so on who given themselves insulin you know juvenile diabetes is is a major issue we have a large number of students who are overweight we can't that that's a you know this that, that's what this whole no child left behind it's just caused people to eliminate so many things to focus you know there's schools who who are eliminating recess and PE so that they can have you know test prep and you know all kinds of other things but yet we have students who are uh, who are obese and students who don't who don't who are not in the habit of moving around and so when they become adults they're not accustomed to moving so my opinion on it is it's a terrible idea um, and if you apply for a job and they tell you that they are not teaching PE, you contact me and I will call them and talk to them the same way I did the Earl's mom and, and Demetrius and whoever else and let them know that um, you know, we, that's a, a major. Now, we, we have PE at our school. We will not eliminate it. Um, and as a matter of fact, my PE teacher is a male. Um, and we, uh, we talk quite often. Again, we're surrounded by women. Which I guess is not a bad thing, right, ladies? Um, but um, but I I, um, I I I feel your pain because um, I know it, it is something that is that is truly needed, and um, it's um, this is um, this is a, one of the uh, one of the, the pitfalls of, of this whole you know leaving no child with the behind is what I you know what I call it you know but I, I support you and I support PE okay yes. And I know there's a, there was a question over here somewhere. Where, okay, I'll come right to you next. Yes. In the talk group that we had, the local talk group over here before the Amazon, how do you go about changing the culture from the African-American and Hispanic one where reading isn't important and education isn't important? It's because you're saying that's where the gap is in our understanding, but and it's because you support everybody's culture, but you've got to change somebody's culture. Mm -hmm. Well, when you well, you make them feel that their culture is important, but then you let them see that that was the whole point I made with if we know that there's a culture of at home of um, of uh, of uh, where reading is not important, where intellectuality is 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 um, is, is, is not is not a topic of conversation, then we can't continue to rely on students to go into that environment and 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 develop that that habit. What we have to do is allow that to take place in school. And then we have to teach students that this is what you are supposed to do. We can't say, well, your parents are supposed. Now, our parents may have taught us that, but we know that their parents are not teaching them that. So we teach them that reading is important. When you go home, here are some books. Take them home and read them. When you come, you want to stay after school while I'm working on my lesson plan, you can read. But we're beginning, we're teaching, and we're showing them because we're, I'm going to give you an opportunity to become a good reader. Then what happens is when that student becomes an adult, that student is now a parent who now knows that reading is important, and now my children are going to read at home. So you, what you have done is you have broken the cycle of poverty. And that's the only way we're going to do it. So that's why it's an excellent question. Although it may have been one that you may have not have wanted to ask, because some people may take that the wrong way when you try to tell them, well, if, if the child's culture is not one that's conducive to becoming a better student, what are you offending me? What are you saying about my culture? Sometimes you may have to go there to get people to understand, no, I don't want to offend you. I want your child to be successful, or I want you as a child, because their children, when you walk into their classroom, they're going to think that you don't care about them. There are people who tell children that if someone doesn't look like you, they don't care about you. They're not interested in you. They don't have anything that you want to do. They don't hold it close to their heart. You have to show those children that's not true. That's why I'm here. That's why I've taken this job where I'm never going to be rich to come here and try to help you. And this is what I want you to do. This I'm, this, I'm gonna show you how I'm going to help you. If that child says there's no poster board at home, when you come in tomorrow morning, there'll be poster board here waiting for you, you know, and I'm gonna help you. And that's how you kind of, and then you tell that child, when you become a parent, you make sure that your child has these things at home, that you create this type of environment. We have to basically begin to raise, we're gonna raise, we're going to raise the next generation of parents. And we're gonna make those Kids, we're going to raise them to be good parents, so therefore the, their children will be in homes where reading is important. And it's tough, and I often say that we have to get in, we have to educate parents too. 
You know, we had a family fun math night at our school. We had a parents that are intimidated by schools. Not, many of these parents didn't have a positive experience in school. Some of them dropped out of school. You know, so, you know, we had a, a big event at our school. We invited all of the parents to come and we asked the kids to run all of the exhibitions, not the teachers. The kids were going to show their parents what they were learning in school. There was a computer station, there was an algebra station. We, uh, we got the 76ers, uh, Allen Iverson guys to, to autograph a basketball, and it was, uh, everything was centered around math, so the parent who guessed the circumference of the ball or came close to it won the basketball. We had a Thanksgiving basket, and the parent who guessed the amount of calories in the basket, turkey and everything, they won the basket. Just trying to get parents a conversation around mathematics, but really we wanted them to come into the school and to be comfortable with the school. And um, at that time, we had about 300 kids, and um, we didn't get a lot of participation in our uh, um, parent-teacher conferences, back to school night, that kind of thing. But we ordered food for 300 people. We were optimistic. We ran out of food in the first hour. So we had to go out and purchase more food. So the parents actually came out and supported this event and supported their children. So it was a way for us to begin to get parents to see, this is what we need, to, we need you to do at home. This is what your child's doing in school. So these are the things we need you to do at home to kind of support them. We've got to kind of get into educating these parents because you're right. If we don't change things, if we don't change the culture, then basically we're just treating the symptom and not the disease. We've got to find a way to change the culture so we can get people to understand that reading is important. So, um, you know, we invite parents to come in and read the kids. You know, we, we asked Harcum College to offer college courses right in our school. And we had parents that came. One just got his bachelor's degree through the program. You know, of course, he had to go on to the campus, but he started taking courses right in our school building. So, so children can see, my mom, my dad is taking classes. School is important to them. Then they begin to know that school is important. Is that, is that okay? All right. Now, you've been waiting a long time. Is that a quote? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh, do you, okay, you amen that. <laughs> how, do you, um, how do you get the exposure in with so much of the news source that only is speaking to the test and then making sure that they're, they're staying on this day? How do you get so much exposure in without getting in trouble with the higher ups but not doing exactly what you want? You know, that's a tough question. I want you to keep your job. I can't have you calling me up asking me to borrow money, you know. Um, it's tough, and that's why I say, you know, you've got to get creative, and that's where the after-school programs come in. Um, that's where we've got to kind of, as, uh, as educators in our own schools, in our own communities, we kind of, uh, kind of get creative and, and say, listen, we, we, want, we want more for our children. And, you know, we've got to get involved in the political process. We've got to get active. We've got to, you know, become our own voice. Y'all have to complain that as educators, you know, we let people, they spend 12 years as a student in school, and then they become a politician or some professional somewhere else, and they feel like an authority on what we do. You know, we've got to get involved uh, with letting people know. There, there are, there's been, um, there's, there's uh, all kinds of statistics that show that test scores have been rising every year in almost every state, but the, but the government has suppressed that information. You know, that what teachers were doing was working. And maybe sure, because you need about five years to truly see if a program is really effective. If we keep changing programs every two years, we, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll never see it. But um, as an administrator, I have a little more authority. And so that's why a lot of times when we do go on, you know, trips or these activities, I kind of get involved and I take the heat from, you know, my superintendent so that the teachers don't. Um, but it, it, it's a risk. Like I say, I'm, the person told me years ago that every day you're going to do something you know, we, you know, you, you could get fired for, but if you know you're doing something that's gonna truly help kids, you know, then you're, you're doing the right thing. You know, just keep your job, but just um, find ways to get creative. I just found that after schools and the weekends just gave me more time. It's more time on task. The programs that are successful, you know, the KIPP schools, if you read about the KIPP schools, those are schools that simply require students to be in school more often. They're in positive envir environments more often. They're around people who care about them more often. So naturally, they're going to be more successful than their colleagues and peers. The problem is it's hard to stay married when you're with kids all the time, you know, after school and, 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 and on the weekends. But that's one that I'll, I'll probably have to work on a response and, and get back to you. You email me, and I'll, I'll kind of think of uh, some ways where we can together get creative. Because, it's, it, and, and, you, and you know, it's, it's not, the process is not slowing. I mean, there's more pressure. You know, they, I mean, they're tightening the noose 
you know, and, and it's frustrating. Uh, many, many of our, I mean, our students are being tested, you know, every month. You know, it, it, it gets frustrating. And for you, because you want to cover a curriculum, and you're like, I used to teach so much more. Now I just can barely touch this. And the students are, are supposed to, to know this. Because when they go to high school and college, they don't want to hear about, well, we were testing most of the time. No, they, they want to look at those scores, you know, those SATs and ACTs. Um, so we'll, we'll, we may have to work on that together. We could probably write a book on that together. You know? Is that it? I know we were running. I know I saw some students leave. I know I kind of went overboard. I told you my students that I'm loquacious now. Yes, sir. Part of the class and what we need Yes, sir. I'm taking the mic off the stand. I'm going to have to get like Usher on this one here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, you know, now number one, your question actually is an excellent point because those students probably deserve the best and most experienced teachers. Um, but I'm sorry, I moved on your camera shot. It's now. all good. It's okay? Yeah. All right, well, I appreciate that. Um, but the opposite happens. When you're new, most of the time, unless you have a wonderful principal who says, I know if I expect this teacher to become a good teacher and to, uh, and to want to stay at my school, I can't give this person the toughest group of kids to work with, put this person in the smallest classroom with the heater that hasn't worked for four years. I can't do that. Sometimes that happens to new teachers. Sometimes you get, because those veteran teachers, again, we make decisions as educators that are good for us and not good for students. So those veteran teachers all run away from those kids and say, let the new kid take them. Knowing that those kids probably need those veteran teachers. But let me let you in on a secret. The last few years, the teachers that I've had that have been most successful with my students who've been the toughest to reach have been my new teachers. And many of them have been white teachers working with primarily African-American students. Teachers who thought that they weren't gonna be successful. Now, yeah, when an African-American teacher walks in, there's an automatic connection because we're from most of the time the same community, same background. But I've had white teachers who walked in and said, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna make it. I was telling a story, I had a kindergarten teacher because in Philadelphia as principals, we don't get the energy teachers. I just have to take whoever's assigned to me. But my salary is based on the performance of my students. That's how powerful the union is in Philadelphia. And I had a teacher who was a kindergarten teacher in private school who was assigned to teach seventh grade in my school. And this teacher was about four feet tall. And she looked at those kids and she said, I'm not going to make it. But those kids ended up loving her. I mean, the entire year, I mean, they, she, she just, for some reason, she had something she was able to reach, reach those kids. And, um, and I love getting new people in because they don't come in, they know everything, they're willing to, to listen, they'll go to professional development. And, and I, I love getting new people. But what I say to you is you've got to come in and you've got to leave everything that you've heard outside the door. And you've got to let the kids know that you've left that outside. That I know that I'm coming here and I may be coming from a different background, but I'm coming here believing that you can make it. And I said this last night, that many times that those students will only believe in themselves because you believe in them. Because they've been taught by their families, their peers, people in the community many times that, you know, you're not going to be anybody. Why are you going to school? What are you going to do with your life? And then here you come, walking in from some city that they probably can't pronounce, and you're coming in saying, you know what? I don't buy into that. You're going to come to school every day. And I want you to say it just like this. You're going to come to school every day, and you're going to work hard in my classroom. You know, and I, and I, I, get, I, I have a, um, finally, I, a second male teacher. I've got a, a 
guy who drives almost an hour a day to come to my school. And I'm going to be quite honest with you. He drove in the summer. He told me he's in the school district assignment he was building. He's a white guy. He had run an after-school uh, tutoring program in Norristown, which is outside of Philly. And he drove into the school and he said, you know, I have a school district assignment me here. I want to come in. I said, sir, you're going to drive an hour a day. I know people who get so frustrated, they don't even want to drive 10 minutes to come in. You're going to drive an hour a day? He said, well, it was, I, you know, I, I wanted to come to the school. It was available. Um, I run an after school program. And um, I said, well, I only have a sixth grade position. And uh, sixth graders were coming from a tough fifth grade classroom. And I said, I had originally put those kids together in a group to work with one of my experienced teachers, but I had an eighth grade teacher who had retired, so I had to move her to eighth grade. I said, so you come, what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of take some of those kids out because that group was put together for a different teacher. He said, no, don't do that. Because if you move those kids out, he said, I'll never know if I could have worked with those kids. Leave them there. And then, I said, wait a minute, I'm the principal, don't tell me what to do. He said, no, leave them. Because if, now, if there's a problem, then maybe we can move some. But at least give me a chance. I had so much respect for him for saying that. Because I know even myself, I probably would say, yeah, take all of them. But um, he took the kids, and these were some children who had had high suspension rates a year before. I mean, he was a tough kid. He came in, he set up what he called a super box. He set his classroom up like a stadium. And he bought a little piece of carpet. So these were the, there were two desks in the room, sometimes four. Those were the only desks that were sitting on carpet. And the students in his room who the week prior had done very well, respect, worked hard, studied, those students sat in the box for the next week. They had box seats. And those students would fight for those box seats because the box seats, when I come in the classroom, I go to the box seats first. So if I come in and I have something I want to give to a student or, you know, the sixes are giving me free tickets or, you know, we've gotten them, I go to the box seats first. So everybody wants to fight to get in the box. This is something that he thought of on his own because he knows that the students, if the students are rewarded for positive behavior, then he'll get more positive behavior instead of coming in and focusing on the negative. He came in and said, I know these, these are kids who last year people had problems. You know what else he did? He told all those teachers because they ran to him at the first faculty meeting, the opening meeting, to tell him about the children that they had sent to him. And he told them, he said, I'm going to be, he talked real slow. He said, I'm going to be quite honest with you. I don't want to hear about those students and what they did last year. They're with me this year, and I'm hoping things are going to be different. And he has done a wonderful job, a wonderful job. The student, there are some students who have multiple suspensions a year before, have had none the year that they, that they were with this teacher. I mean, un unbelievable. And simply because he came in and said, you know, I know, and I'm sure, you know, he had some experience working with them. He was running an after-school <coughs> program for some students um, in Norristown, which is a suburb of Philly, but it's, um, it's becoming more urban. But I'm sure also it was that he came in and he, and he told the students, I have high expectations. Now, I had some students, and he and I went to war a little bit because I had some students that were honor roll students for a couple of years. One kid was an MG kid, and he failed him. He gave him an F. And, you know, of course, the mother came to me and said, how can you allow this man? But you know what? This man came to me. He laid out everything that student had done and had not done. And I said, ma'am, if you were the teacher, what would you give your son? She could only answer that, you know, but he, he had high expectations for those kids. He wanted them to achieve, and he, and he really made a difference. And I think the important thing was that he came in and said, I don't want to hear what any of your complaints from last year, any of the complaints that I received from other people, it's us together here. And I believe in you, and I know I'm new, and he learned a lot about the community. You know, he would uh, go out and visit with some of the families, you know, the kids, and there was a recreation center in the neighborhood. He'd go to the recreation center sometimes just to kind of get to know the environment that they come from. And when they see that, they see, okay, this is someone that's really interested in me. I'm telling you, you walk into a community center, a laundromat, anything in the community where your students live, and you're like a rock star. I mean, because they only see you in the school, and they think that, oh, this person will. The only time they spend, the only time they spend in our community is from our school, maybe to the store for lunch and back. They're in the car and they're gone. When you walk into a church, when you walk into a health clinic, anything in the community as part of this student's environment, your respect, like your status goes, I mean, your Q factor just goes way up because you have now said to those students, it's more than about you. See, I want to learn about your community. I want to learn about your culture. 
Because if I understand that and know where you're coming from, then I can help you go to a much better place. And it's not about, I'm going to come in and be your savior. I'm going to come in and, and, and offer you something that no one else has been able to do. No, I'm just simply here to help you because somebody helped me. And um, if you have that attitude and believe in what you were given, the foundation that you received in college, even the experiences that you have with your friends here. There are many times when I rely on some of my experiences that I've had, and I share those with my students. Some experiences I had in college, some of the conversations that, that we've had. Sometimes I've had to call some of my friends that were teachers also to get their opinion on some things. There have been some kids that have really made me contemplate whether I need to have to take a different job. You know, you'll have those, but just know that the, the, the majority of those students will be blessed to have you, and especially as a male teacher, because so many will be coming from homes where they've never had any interaction with positive males, no male interaction. My father never ever said to me, I love you, son, never. I, I grew up never knowing that a man could love his son, that men could love each other. I, I never knew that, and it affected the way that I loved the females in my life. You know, so for a young man to, to be able to hear from another man, you know, you, you know, you can be smart. Because see, smart is not something, not smart is not something you are. Smart is something you become. So when you say to a kid, oh, you're going to become smart. Because if you don't, I don't get paid, number one. But number two, I know that if I do this, then it will encourage other young people to do the same thing. Just follow, just follow your heart. Just follow your, I'm just glad that you made the decision to go into this field because we really do need we really do. Need, I mean, women have been carrying this profession for years. We need men to get involved because it's no secret that our boys are at the bottom of the totem pole. Every category. You know, it's because they don't see that there are men out there who embrace and support education. So when they see you, just your presence will make a difference. Okay? Now, I know that was a long answer. Okay? So you may have to get that on tape for you. Okay? Was that, is that enough? Sure now, I can go on. Because my students say, Mr. L, you have diarrhea of mouth. You know, I just, I just keep going. So is that it? Oh, I'd like to thank you very much for uh, welcoming to me to your home. Um, I have had a, a great time. Um, I just, the next interview, I'd like it to be maybe at 9 a.m. and not 7 a.m. Although I don't know if anyone saw it, but it was a, it was a very nice, uh, very, did you see it, ma'am? Very young, very, very, very young. I think those guys do a, a wonderful job over there. And, and um, I could see, I didn't know that that young lady was an education reporter at some time, but I could see that there was a passion for, uh, for education and for kids. So, uh, and actually one of the employees there is a student here. So um, she made sure she came to let me know. I'm, and I was there last night. So I said, good, very good. Um, but thank you. And I'm not Arnold Schwarzenegger, but I'll be back. Okay? All right, thanks. <laughs> And also, thanks to your professors and teachers also, because you know, it was those guys that invited me, and it, it just shows you that they care about you to get me up early in the morning to get here to talk to you. So God bless them, too. Okay, Deb Clark has it, so we'll get them to you. Okay. Hey, Dad. Uh -huh.